So we're continuing in our identity series. Uh, this is the, um, uh, I shared with you all last week or for the last few weeks, so you don't be surprised. I've been sharing with you all that next week is test time. All right. So I'm just letting you know, like I'm, I'm just all in fair warning. Next week is test time. So if you want to pick a Sunday where you don't come, you know, because you like afraid, like, oh, man, maybe I could do a makeup in a shorter time frame. Uh, next week is test time. It's going to be a lot of fun. And um, I can neither confirm nor deny if there will be significant prizes for those who win. But I would... I would suggest, I mean, I, I mean, I'll give you this much. There will be, there will be a Kahoot happening. So, um, so, you know, listen, just get your Kahoot skills together. If you want to download the app right away, I mean, do what you need to do, but I would suggest maybe going back, looking at your notes over the last few weeks, et cetera. Um, you know, videos, all that stuff, you know, just turn your plate down if you just need to fast and ask the Lord to give you divine revelation on whatever the heck I've been saying. Um, you can do that as well. So so today, um, uh, Lord willing, we are finishing up our, um, our values. Uh, we've been looking at our identity, what makes up identity, our identity in, in Christ, our identity um, uh, as, a, as a body our identity as, as, as individuals, how those all flow out of who, who God is. And so we've looked at our vision, mission, purpose. Last week, we got introduced to uh, our, our you know, three of the four brothers, the, the, right? Missional, the four Al brothers, Missional, Devotional, Biblical. Okay. All right. So uh, today we meet the last of the four Owl brothers and then we get introduced to their cousin, Sean. All right. So uh, core value number four, core value number four. And today it's going to be a little bit different too, uh, just to kind of prime you for next week. So, um, so we're going to do a few things differently today, but uh, core value number four is we are connectional. We are connectional. So biblical, missional, devotional, we are connectional. If you think about who you are as individuals, who you are within your family context, uh, whether that's, you know, your, your own family in your household, your family of origin, uh, how you're connected in community, uh, we all have a number of different ways by which we are connected. There's varying strings, strings of, of connection for us. It could be location, it could be uh, vocation, uh, vacation, <laughs> uh, it could be interest, if you play on a team, right, uh, DNA uh, connects us. There's a lot, there's lots of different things uh, that connects us. And, you know, while these things do bring connection to us and, and for us, it, those things in and of themselves don't necessarily take us deeper as it relates to being connectional. So you can be in a relationship in a home where you share a dwelling place with someone, whether it's a roommate, spouse, sibling, whatever it is, you could be connected because of, again, your DNA, because of the fact that you live in the same house. But that space, that, that, that thread doesn't necessarily take you to a deeper place of intimacy. You can be working in uh, any type of job that would assume maybe there's deeper intimate connection. You could be a teacher at a school. You could be a person on staff at a church. And there could be this sense that, oh, there's this connection that we have because of our common vocation. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you are driven, that you are diving deeper into intimate connection, transparent connection, life-changing 
connection. We can be connected and disconnected at the same time. Connection is more than just collegiality. It's more than just being uh, in association with each other. Why? Well, because if we're honest, in most cases, right, most cases, when we're really pressed, we really want to do things on our own. I mean, let's be real, y'all. I know some of y'all like really super, super spiritual and like, no, like I just want to be in the body and wherever the body is, however the body is working, I want to be a part of that. That's, listen, y'all, that ain't our default. That takes supernatural breaking for us to actually be in communion, to be in connection with each other. Now, this isn't to suggest that we should search for just surface relationships. We should search and try to cultivate healthy, life-giving, and holy relationships. And those relationships ought to help us get out of our comfort zone, to grow us deeper into Christ, further in his mission. Uh, as Paulita mentioned, and as we're all well aware of, uh, this is Indigenous People's Month, and uh, one of our Indigenous elders in our denomination, uh, Lenora Three Stars, uh, one of the things that she talks about all the time is the, the connection that we have with each other that extends outside of the clan that we're connected. We are cousins. We are brothers. We are sisters. And that connection even goes into the creation. And some people like to just think that that's just, oh, you're getting into mysticism. No, let's look at the scriptures. The scriptures clearly have us in connection, in relationship with the creation. And that has been broken. And so we want to be mindful of that. Now, there are two aspects of connection that I want us to just hone in on a little bit. And then I'm going to read something to you. But two aspects of, of connection. The first is this. The first is we are connected with each other. We're connected with each other. So there is a connection that we share just because we're in this space together, right? Uh, there's a connection that we have, a shared experience that we're having together because we're in this space. Again, if you think about it from uh, a family perspective, a communal perspective, right, there is, there is experiences, there are experiences that you have, that we have, simply because we're in space together, because there might be an event that we are experiencing. The Bible is replete with examples of both positive and negative relational connections. One of, um, you know, the, the negative places, because we know a lot of the positive places, but it's hard to remember like some of the negative relational connections. And one of them that is always been uh, like kind of a gasp to me, even, you know, every time I look at it, and I've, you know, it's a scripture in Acts where at the kind of at the end of Paul's, towards the end of his, his journeys, the religious leaders, and it says this, it says that they bound themselves with an oath not to eat until Paul was dead. They made a covenant to fast, to not eat until they had killed Paul. Now, I don't know how long that lasted for them, how committed they might have been, but um, that was something that uh, is a, as a, an example of this, this negative um, connectional uh, aspect. In the covenant, uh, in the forming of the covenant back in the early or the late 1800s, uh, there was a slogan that says, I am a friend to all who fear thee. Right? And so, so this issue of being connected across uh, lines of, of, of theology, of doctrine, of of denomination, if we fear the Lord, 
um, you know, we, we, are, we are friends. And certainly Christ um, even calls us to be friends to those who we even call enemy. So this first one, again, is about this connection with each other. The second one, I think, is a little bit more nuanced and probably something that we don't think about as much. When we think about connectional, there's also this connectional aspect of being connected for each other. Being connected for each other. Um, I like to think about this in relationship to a bridge analogy, right? What is a bridge designed to do, right? A bridge is like if I called somebody up here who was like really, really fit, like if I'm looking around right now and saying, you know, like if I said, Paul, like, can you come up here and do a bridge, right? You know, you know, the Paul would like have no problem doing something like that. And right. And the question would be, why? Why would you, how would that even work in this illustration? Well, it doesn't. It makes no sense whatsoever. But there's other bridges that actually connect us from one place to another. Any bridge that's built, it's designed to take you over something to get you from one place to another because either there's a chasm, there's some kind of gap, there's water, there's something, there's alligators. I don't know, but there's a bridge that takes you from one place to another. I told you next week we'll have a, a quiz. Well, let's, let's just prime you right now. See how many of you know where these lyrics come from? When you're weary, feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I will dry them all. I'm on your side. Oh, when times get rough and friends just can't be found. Who knows the rest? Like a bridge over troubled waters, I will lay me down. Simon and Garfunkel. Y'all might say, okay, I know nothing about that. Simon and who? Garfunkel? I thought they were a magician act. What about this one? In times of crisis, the wise build bridges while the foolish build barriers. Who said that? King T'Challa, Wakanda. <laughs> forever. As I was preparing this week, I came across this blog, um, this article that, it's not really a blog, the person does blogging, but it's an article um, that, they, that they wrote. Uh, Dr. Carissa Quinn, she's the digital learning ma manager for the Bible Project. And, uh, and she wrote this article that I thought um, really captured this notion of what it means for us to be connectional here at Epiphany. So I want to read this to you. It's edited, like I had to edit it um, because it was really long, but, um, but just listen to, to these words that she has to say. It's, it's settle in here. She says, deep down at the core of our being, we all have a longing for wholeness. The way we experience this basic desire in our day-to-day -day lives may be different. Maybe it's a sense of belonging, when we experience resonance with someone, or in times when we are accepted. Maybe it's a hollow feeling of disconnection or loneliness or perhaps a compulsion to soothe pain in an unhealthy way. Whatever the case, the desire for wholeness is basic to the human experience. So what light does the biblical story shed on this deep desire for wholeness? Where does it come from? Where do we foster it? The way scripture portrays God's essence and the way the biblical story begins are two excellent starting points to begin exploring this concept. Both of these avenues affirm that humanity is designed for connection and that in its connection with God and others, there is the heart of wholeness. 
Now, some of us probably assume that we know what there is to know about connection, or maybe connection feels too difficult, too risky, too painful, or simply too time consuming. Perhaps connection feels like one more thing to do in order to be a good person rather than something that is life-giving. But the biblical story gives us a different perspective on connection, one that is first and foremost rooted in the identity of God. This is for us why identity is critical. So who is God and how does this relate to our deep-rooted desire for connection? While it's easy to view God primarily as ruler, creator, or judge, each of those roles is contingent upon creation. God can't be a judge without something to judge. God can't be creator without having something created, right? Each of those roles is contingent upon creation. Rather, our clearest definition of who God is comes from 1 John 4, 8. God is love. But even this can seem a bit hazy. Does this verse mean that God is loving or that he feels feelings of love towards us? Actually, the phrase God is love refers to something so much more than God's character or disposition. It describes his very essence. At the essence of his beginning, of his being, of his ending, which there is none, God is an others-oriented, self-given being. For all of eternity, he he has existed in a community of perfect love as Father, Son, and Spirit. This is what is meant by the phrase, God is love. He does not just have love. He is love, and this directly impacts our own relational identity and our need for connection. The way the biblical story begins shows that like God, humans are relational beings. The first pages of the Bible illuminate that humans are designed for connection with God and others, and they also portray the tragic and familiar experience of disconnection. The most repeated phrase in Genesis 1, God saw that it was good, depicts a generous God who creates a delightful world in which humanity can flourish. On day six, at the pinnacle of his creative work, this tightly structured literary rhythm breaks, which is the author's way of signaling to the reader that what is about to be said is really important. Genesis 1, 26 through 27 reads as follows. Then God said, let us make humanity in our image according to our likeness. Let them rule over the fish of the sea the birds of the sky, the animals, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created humanity in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. These are the first two verses in the Bible that speak of humans. And in them, we see subtle indications that humanity was designed for connection with God and others. In verse 26, we learn that God's design is for humans to rule on his behalf, to partner with him in creatively bringing about flourishing and beauty on the earth and for others. This is significant because it shows that God did not just want humans to relate to him as his puppet servants but as his partners, connected to him and ruling on his behalf. In fact, in Genesis 3, we read that God dwells in the garden with the humans, walks among them and converses with them. 
In verse 27, we see that in addition to connection with God, humanity was also de- designed for connection with one another. Verse 27 says, God created humanity in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. This verse consists of three parallel lines, the first two of which emphasize through repetition that God created humanity in his own image. The last line defines what this means. There are distinct and diverse individuals, male and female, who are united as one as humanity. Although they are different and distinct, humans are connected to one another. Humanity's design for connection is further elaborated in Genesis 2, which zooms in to retell the creation of humanity from one other perspective. Here we encounter God's perspective on human aloneness. It is not good. And we learn that the solution is relationship. But it's not just any kind of relationship. Rather, it's relationship characterized by incredible unity and vulnerability. The intended connection between humans is indicated in a variety of ways. The woman is created from the man's side as if one person is split into two. They are the same bone and flesh. And their Hebrew names, Ish and Isha, correspond to one another. Verse 25 of chapter 2 concludes this section of creation and states this. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. This verse exposes the death of hum- the depth <laughs> depth of human connection in other words the ideal picture of human connection is one of relational safety vulnerability trust and acceptance of each other but we know how the story goes from here when the humans listened to the snake of genesis 3 and ate of the tree They seized autonomy from God and chose to define good and evil on their own. Their trust in God and one another was lost. They did what was good in their own eyes rather than trusting God. They disconnected themselves from partnership with God. They injured one another through blame. They lost trust with each other, depicted by covering their nakedness. And they no longer had the safety of vulnerability in this new broken culture. And their disconnection began a vicious cycle that begot more disconnection, more violence, more death, told in the many chapters that follow. Yet, Even in the midst of the initial rebellion and its consequences of pain and disconnection, God promises to work through the human situation. Glory to God. That is good news. He promises to work through this situation. He promises to destroy the source of this disconnection and restore connection to himself and to one another. If God were a solitary deity who had created humans with the only purpose of serving him, they would have failed. The story would have ended right there. But that didn't happen. The triune God who is at the core of self-giving and others oriented, acts in alignment with who he is. So the rest of the story develops God's plan to include humanity in his perfect community 
of love. Ultimately, this self-giving and others-oriented God gives his very self for others and includes humanity in Christ to join the eternal community of perfect love. And this God, who has created humans for connection with himself and each other, he will stop at nothing until that perfect connection is restored. And yet, we live in a time and a place where there is still tension between our true identity as connected beings and the reality of disconnection, pain, and suffering. It's a time when trust may not be natural and relationships are not always safe. The biblical story reminds us that connection is what we are made for. We will be our truest selves as we meditate on God's essence as a perfect community of love and find creative and intentional ways to connect with God and others. The biblical story offers hope that despite the inevitable pain of disconnection, living into our true identity as connected beings brings wholeness. We are connectional. We are designed to be connected with and for each other. Core value number five, we practice reconciliation. We practice reconciliation. So listen, as we've seen, God has made us to be connected. We're connected beings. His design, his intent, his original design was for us to be in this harmonious connection with him and with each other and also with creation. I've said this before, I'll say it to, as, again because it's, it's, it's uh, deeply related to this, to this notion of, of we practice reconciliation. We did not begin, our inceptions, our original origins did not have us first and foremost sinful beings. I know that's going to mess with a lot of people's theology. Our initial original beings were, were not sinful. We inherited a sin nature. If we were originally and first and foremost in God's plan and design created as sinful, broken people, then there is nothing to reconcile. What is God reconciling? God is trying to, he's trying to make whole again that which he first created. So we did not first have a sin nature. We were fearfully and wonderfully made. Yes, we were shaping in iniquity. Yes, those things are true. It's an inheritance. It was added on to us. I want you to understand this because this really helps to shape identity. This does not mean in any stretch of the imagination that we are not without need of a savior, that we are not sinful, that we don't, uh, you know, some of us right now in this very second are thinking sinful thoughts because we've got this sin nature. Here's the crazy thing that I've just been like amazed by in God's revelation as it relates to reconciliation, him trying to reconcile uh, this this world and, and, and us to himself. We've got this sin nature that the scriptures declare that Christ has defeated. He's defeated the power that the sin nature has over us. That power is now defeated. It's done. It's a wrap. TKO, knockout, whatever you, submission, whatever you want to, that is defeated. Here's 
the crazy thing about who we are as human beings, as God imagers, God likers, there are things that we are like God. You know, God gives uh, to the body spiritual gifts. <laughs> to some, he's given this. To some, he's given this. To others, he's given this. You know what a gift that we all have? The power of resurrection. Power of resurrection. Y'all might say, what? What are you talking about? Christ has killed the power of sin nature in our bodies. And we breathe life into that nature. Resuscitated. Get the pads. We resurrect that sin nature every day. This is why Paul says this. He says in Romans, he says, I, the things I want to do, I don't do. This is Paul. This is, this is like, this is, this is the dude. He says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do are the very things I keep doing. And then he says this. He says, who will rescue me from this body of death? Now, some people will believe, and I think this illustration makes sense. I mean, it's a little bit of a stretch, but I, I think there's some merit to it. Some people believe that, uh, that when Paul was in prison, one of the things that, that he was making an illustration of, he says, you know, who will rescue me from this body of death? Some, will, some historians say that one of the practices of a death sentence back then, because, you know, they, they had all kinds of gruesome ways to, to kill people. I mean, just ridiculously gruesome, inhuman, right? As if there's a humane way to kill somebody, but you get what I'm saying? Like there's, they, they, they said one of the ways uh, was that a, a person, a, a prisoner would actually have a corpse tied to their body as they were in prison. And this corpse was, was undefeated. Because the corpse, the decaying bacteria, all the stuff that's in that body will eventually take over this human living being. And it's this slow, persecuting death. And Paul says, who will rescue me from this? So some people believe that as Paul was in prison writing this, this letter to the church at Rome, that he had never seen before. He didn't plant this church. He, he only heard about them. Some believe that while he was in prison writing this, this was some of the imagery that he had. Who will rescue me from this body of death? And he says, thanks be to God for Jesus Christ. We have this power to resurrect that which is dead. We do it all the time. Christ has put to death the sinful nature. He's destroyed the hostility wall that causes division and we resurrect it. We breathe life into it. We say, not you, not you, not what you, mm -mm. you voted what way? God is trying to do some reconciliation work. I'm running out of time here. Let me get back to this. He says, though you were exiled, right? This connection I had, it caused, it caused you to be exiled from me. It caused you to be, even in the Old Testament, we see God, God, there was exile for Adam and Eve. There was exile for the nation of Israel, right? There, there's exile. You, you've broken it, and so there's exile, but I'm not going to leave you in exile. I'm going to bring you back. There's reconciliation. We can't understand the truth of reconciliation without first understanding that we're exiled that there's something that we got to be brought back into. So I want to show you a quick video here. Um, it's, about, it's about four and a half, five minutes long. So this issue of reconciliation, God reconciling all things to himself, has to be understood within the context of exile. And in our minds, we've exiled ourselves from each other, from God, from his intentional in created order. I'm going to read a few passages for you to help capture this, and then we'll get to our last, our last value. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 through 22 say this, 
The son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all of his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were exiles, you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose, purpose answers the question, why? Why, God? His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Second Corinthians 15 chapter five. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone. The new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. We practice reconciliation, not because it's easy, not because it's the cool social justice thing to do, because it's God's command. It's our call. This is why we do it. Last, core value number six, the last Sean, we practice multiplication. So as we've seen, we've talked about this, we, we've shared this not just in this series, we know that the scriptures, the Bible is this unified story. It has many major themes, but one of those themes is the theme of multiplication. Multiplication. Now, as I've thought about multiplication over the years, I often used to think about this until recently about, I thought about uh, uh, multiplication as exponential, as exponential, right? Um, like, 
10 to the fifth power, 10 to the 10th power, right? This like it's exponential. But multiplication is not necessarily exponential. It can be exponential, but it's not necessarily exponential. Multiplication is to increase in number rapidly, especially rapidly, or just in multiples. So a family could multiply if all of a sudden twins are born to that family. That's not necessarily exponential growth, but it's multiplied. There's growth that happens in multiples. And, and that subtle difference got me to some greater clarity and epiphany about who we are. And so as we close here, I want you to understand something um, I'm going to read a few passages for you. And like we did last week, um, I had you close your eyes at the risk of you falling asleep. Um, and so uh, since you've practiced that last week, you got a little bit under your skin. You kind of exercise that eyelid muscle, not falling asleep. Um, and so, so I'm going to give you this another chance at this, right? So I'm going to read some text to you. And I want you to really, again, just, just close your eyes because I want you to get a sense, like put yourself in this place of multiplication, of, of God's word, seeing the theme of multiplication in God's word. All right, so everybody close your eyes. Genesis chapter one, God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds, and it was so. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Genesis 22, God said to Abraham, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. As the Israelites were entering into Canaan in Deuteronomy 6, Moses said to them, Hear Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. In Matthew chapter 14, Jesus multiplied five fish and two loaves of bread so that more than 5,000 people were fed from five fish, two loaves. We've seen earlier in this series, in Matthew 28, Jesus commands his disciples to multiply his mission, he says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. In Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, Along with the 11, there were about 120 disciples present when Peter preached his inaugural sermon. And at the end of that sermon, about 3,000 people were saved on that day. And Luke records it in Acts chapter 2. He says this, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You can open your eyes. The Apostle Paul, he continued on in this theme of multiplication. 
before his conversion, Saul had a multiplication ministry of persecution. He had a multiplication ministry of persecution. But when God gets a hold of a person with an open heart, anybody who has an open heart, not all hell, all heaven can break loose. All heaven can break loose. And this is what happens with Paul. Jesus transformed Saul into Paul and turned his multiplying movement of kingdom destruction into a multiplying movement of kingdom advancement. And one of the products, one of his offspring of his multiplication ministry was a guy named Timothy, this young guy who was a little bit timid, a little bit scared, a little bit skittish, but Paul poured into him. Now, Paul, at the end of his life, could have said to Timothy, Timothy, I think we're done. I think we have completed the journey. Multiplication is over. We're good. We finished the course. But what does he say? In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Paul had a multiplication strategy, and we'll end with this. And I just want you to stand to your feet as we read this last one. Because we said at the beginning that the Bible is this unified story with many themes, and one of those themes is multiplication. We've seen some examples of that, and here's the last one. One of my favorites, I got to admit, it's one of our founding scriptures here at Epiphany. The Apostle John is essentially left for dead. He's imprisoned on this isolated island called Patmos. It seems like everybody else is doing these great things. Paul's doing great things. Peter's doing great things. James, the brother of John, like they're, they're, they're all doing these things. And, and it seems like John is just kind of left, left for dead, left. But God saves his final revelation for John. Jesus comes to him on this island. The angels are ministering to him. And he shares this vision of what is to come. And then John says this, after he's getting all, all of this revelation, all this, I mean, it's his mind, I believe, is just being blown. In Revelation chapter 7, he says this, After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count. You know what multiplication leads to? Multiplication leads to a multitude. He says, I looked, and I saw this great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, every people and language standing before the throne and before the lamb. Glory to God. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and the lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, these in white robes, who are they? And where did they come from? I answered, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. 
They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Listen to that. They made them white in the blood of the lamb. It makes no sense, y'all. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat for the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. A core value for who we are is multiplication. And like I've said before, it's not multiplication like you might think. Some people might think multiplication is about us outgrowing this space. Listen, if we outgrow this space and we're not being biblical, we're not being connectional, we're not being missional, we're not being devotional, we're not practicing reconciliation, then we have failed. All we're doing is just adding people to a cool Sunday gathering. But if we outgrow this space because more churches are being planted like this, that some of you are in here saying, yes, it's me. I think God is calling me to start something. If we're multiplying that like that, glory to God, then we're fulfilling the mission. I hope we never outgrow this space if we're not being faithful to God's mission for us. Our purpose, our vision, our mission our core values, these things shape our identity, who we are. We are by no means there yet, not even close. We're still a baby in many senses of the word. Some of you are still trying to figure out, is this really the place for me? And that's fine. What we want you to understand is if you're saying yes, here's what it's about. It's going to be messy. It's going to be ugly sometimes. But if we practice these values, if we live into our mission, our vision, our purpose, then even though it gets messy, we'll still be faithful. God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the power of your word. Thank you that even though, even though we put ourselves in exile, even though we defied you and talked about other image bearers of of you, even though we haven't taken care, we haven't stewarded this creation that you've given us, even though we've done all these things that completely violate who you are, you have not left us without an escape plan. Say to us, given you my son. I've given me to you. All you got to do is put your faith in what I've done for you and then live for me. That's what we want to do. That's what we long to do. Forgive us from breaking that code. Lead us into paths of righteousness. And as we do it, God, we'll be careful to give you what you deserve, which is all the glory, all the praise, and all the honor. We all said together, amen and amen.